book called Magna Carta. It is a it is a big document to help us with regards to our lives, how to move through uh, what we think of as doctrine. And so there is the, the text and the gospel, the good news of Christ, but then there is the application of that as we live in community. Because if you recognize and if you have been reading your Bible and if you've been studying the Old Testament and the New Testament, you realize that from the very beginning, God realized that we were not to live life alone. See, Adam, in fact, was lonely and needed help with life. And so therefore, a woman was created, and later the family comes, and then the family gets bigger as we cross the Red Sea. It becomes a multitude of people who are traveling together. Acts chapter 2, we'll find that people, uh, after the resurrection and ascension of Christ, we realize that, uh, that people were living together in community. Acts says that they shared with each other. They shared what they had. They shared their food together. They shared their doctrine together, their belief on Christ together. They shared. And so Romans helps us to understand what it means to be a part of the collective, what it means to be a part of the church, the local church, and the church universal. What does it mean to be a part of the family? I would contend that because God created family, the best way to live is not isolated, but as family. Don't shoot me down yet, because let me explain to you what I mean. Uh, the, the text says that the, one of the things that the devil tries to do is to sift us as wheat. Yes. It, it is the job of the enemy to try to divide us rather than keep us together. And so that's why it's, it's, it sometimes feels simpler for us to be isolated. And when we have troubles in our way, the first thing that the enemy tries to do is separate us from the very help. Yeah. See, when you by yourself in your own pity and your destruction and your depression, you find out that oftentimes you become sick and you implode rather than explode. And what happens is you become sicker and sicker, not only emotionally, but physically. Your heart beats differently and your mind thinks differently when you are challenged with a problem that one must live and work by themselves. I will tell you right now that I think that the ants have this thing covered because they realize that you got to work together to get something done. I'll tell you, I believe the bees got this thing together because they might travel by themselves, but they come back home. It is important that we realize that family is important to who we are as human. And when I say family, I don't mean just those who are born together, but those who choose to be family together as in the collective church. Yeah. And so I would say to you today that the best way to live is the way that God has set this thing up. And that is that no man is an island that we should never try to live in and of and by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think this text gives us some idea of what we need to do in order to have the best of life, how to have the best life. Now, if you've talked to me long enough, you know that I absolutely love a particular commercial that most preachers wouldn't admit that they like, but you know that I love the high life commercials. I, I, I particularly like the old high life commercial where the fella comes in and he's got the cart and he walks into the convenience store and he starts putting all of the high life beers back on the cart and he's taking them out and they want to know what are you doing and he says I'm taking them back because you don't understand how to live the high life. <laughs> and, and, and you know for me I, I, I look at that commercial and I think to myself you know I wish sometimes I could just walk into somebody's house and take the Bible and dust it off and take it out, and they say, well, why are you coming by? I say, why? Because you don't know how to use it. Right? See, I, I feel like if you got something wonderful in your house, you ought to know how to use it. Uh -huh. uh, just like today. Uh, Y'all can say there's no racism in America if you want to, but I tell you what, I don't think I would be poor and white at the same time. Uh -huh. right. See, there are certain things that if you got some privileges, you ought to use those privileges. Uh -huh. There are certain kinds of things that, that happen in our lives that oftentimes we set them aside when we should be using them to our advantage. Mm. 
Far too many times we don't use the stuff to our advantage that God has given us. And one of the things that we have to our advantage, especially in this particular cultural, economic, and political environment, the only thing that we really have left is the very thing that we don't use, and that is our togetherness. Okay. We tell you right now that it still takes a village to raise a child, but not only does it take a village to raise a child, it takes a village to get by these things. We need to be helping each other and talking to each other. If you know a way that is better than my way, we need to share those ways. But we cannot do it when we allow the enemy to isolate us and, and cause us to, to fight one another like crabs in a barrel. Mm -hmm. we got to help each other. And so the first thing that I tell you, look at verse 1 and tell you right there. It says, verse 12, I mean chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reason. So present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So I tell you, the best way to live is to give yourself away. You, you got to be willing to give yourself away. See, part of the problem, Brother Jay, is that we are so selfish that we don't want to help each other. See, if you know something that I don't know, you want to use it to your advantage, but you don't want to help me. And, and, and oftentimes we, sometimes we'll, we'll bite our nose to spite our face, that old adage. We, we will do things and we try to do it isolated because we don't want anybody in our business. But sometimes you've got to share some things in order to get further in life. Mm -hmm. See, you know, right now people talking about, well, we don't own any businesses in our community. I can't afford to do nothing by myself. That is true. The average person probably in this church couldn't go get to the bank and get $1,000 right now. Matter of fact, if you can, can you loan me, sir? No, but anyway, a lot of us don't have a whole bunch of money in the bank. And so if somebody said, well, could you start a business? No, I can't start a business because I don't have any money. But guess what? You could if four or five of you got together. Might need 10 of you to get together. But if we began to get together and we stick together and stand together and begin to work together and work with each other then rather than to be against each other, then things can happen. You know, I've often said, I'll say it, and I, I've said it publicly, I've said it privately, and I still mean it, it's the truth. Uh, we got we got four major churches on this one street, half time, we're not speaking to each other. Mm. 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 And that's a problem. Because the fact is, we would be so much better if we were all together if we, uh, rather than to be divided. And I'm not the odd man out, we just don't speak to each other. And that's what happens. And churches are doing it all across the country. Your church is your church. You trying to be a mega church and you want your church to be bigger than my church. Who cares? Mm. At the end of the day, we ought to be caring about each other and how we can all survive together. Because divided, we'll never get anywhere. Is this going on the internet? Because I want you to know that I'm talking to you. <laughs> that the fact is, as long as our churches are divided, we can stop talking about politics. Because I can tell you, the orange man or the woman doesn't care about what is happening to us. Amen. It is when we finally realize that we must stand together on our faith. Amen. All right. Not standing together because of some civil rights issue, but standing together because it is the Christian way to move forward. All right. We will never get ahead as long as we're trying to do it man's way and not God's way. God has created us to be together and to work together. The early church was the church. And now we're moving against each other. Notice, let me, I can prove it to you. Don't look at me with the side eye. The, the, the point is, look at the epistles. There is a letter who to the Romans, am I right about it? There is a letter then to the Ephesians, am I right about it? There was a letter then to the Philippians, am I right about that? He didn't write a letter to the First Baptist Church at Philippi. He didn't write a letter to the Good Man Baptist Church in Rome. He didn't write a letter to the Shallow Baptist Church in Ephesus. He wrote a letter to the whole city. That ought to tell us that the Christian church ought not be divided by these little blockades of places here and there. It's not divided by brick and mortar. It's not divided by how tall your steeple is or how big your parking lot is. It's not divided. It is one church because it is one Savior who has died for us all. But as long as we're walking around selfishly, we're never going to get anywhere like that. Because the devil gets his way. 
as long as we are divided and self-destructed because a house divided against itself cannot stand. So preacher, that's the problem, but ask me what the solution is. Glad you asked. Look at verse 2. It tells you, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, the fact is, we got to change some things. Somebody got to finally wake up and be conscious. And realize that as long as we are sleeping and as long as we are living the world's way, we will never move forward. The world is showing you right now what they do in an election. And that is, rather than to speak about the good that is in me, I'd rather put you down so that I can be raised up. See, as long as we do church that way, whereby Brother Saunders, I am only good because of how bad you are, then it's not going to work. But see, that's what we do. I would rather put down the sin that I don't like and the sinners that I don't like in order to build myself up because I look better when you look bad. But when we're transformed and we're no longer like this world, then we seek after that which is good rather than to focus on the work that the devil is doing. Yes. God is calling us to transform our minds to be changed in the presence of God, not to work and operate and act like the world. The church ought to be expecting a miracle. Yes. Amen. See, I, I, like, I, I like some Sister Lisa worship time. Because uh, when I say Sister Lisa, I think if you've been in this church for a while, you realize that when the chips are down, if you want somebody to praise God with you, in spite of what's in the, in the midst, all you got to do is talk to Sister Lisa. Yeah. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you, when it seems like you at the brokenest moment and the lowest moment, her thing is he's going to fix it, and all you got to do is get ready. And so the fact is, we need some transforming faith that says that when the chips are down, just wait on God. Yeah. But when, when everything seems like it's going awry, just wait on God. When all of your resources seem like they're drying out, hey. just wait on God. When your kids seem like they need a little help uh, academically, wait on God. When it seems that you can't make that mortgage payment, wait on God. When it seems that the car isn't working right, wait on God. When it seems that the marriage isn't working right, it's an opportunity for God to take a setback and set me up for a comeback. And I'm just waiting on God. The world says when you're done, you're done. Yeah. But when you transform your mind, yeah. you realize that when you're done, you're not done. Right. You just stand and wait for God mm -hmm. to bring you back again. Mm -hmm. He's a comeback God. Yes, and so our minds have to be transformed. We cannot think like the world and then we cannot cause ourselves to become beggars and borrowers like the world. See, because our eyes are so big. We want so much stuff that we let the stuff become the focus of what we do. I, I want a bigger church so that I can drive a Benz and live in a gated community with a, with a, with a stone brick cobblestone driveway. Me and my wife, we empty nesters. What do we need 25,000 square feet for? House bigger than the church. Car costs more than the church van. What do we need it for? Because the other guy got it. Mm -hmm. Why do you need more? Why do you need bigger? Because the other guy got it. That's the world's way. Mm -hmm. The way of Christ, he says, that if they ask for your coat, then give them also your coat. If they ask for one, give them more. In other words, our position ought to be to give more than they ask for. To be kinder than necessary. It is the transforming of the mind. The world says, get as much as you can. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here that needed an EpiPen today. Because if you needed one, you realize the world says that I want more profit and I want less product. In other words, I'll give you less and I'll take more from you. Right. The church is a place and Christians ought to be people who are like the Chick-fil-A philosophy. Now, I stopped eating chicken, but I tell you, I still go to Chick-fil-A. I go there and get the fries, if nothing else. <laughs> I, I want to support Chick-fil-A as long as they're open. 
Because I tell you one thing, the family said, look, we're not going to open on Sunday. We can make as many fries and, and, and nuggets or whatever. We can, we can make money uh, between Monday and Saturday. And we close one day a week to rest and to praise God. Yes. Uh, the second thing is they continue to hold on to their principles and, and they have decided that they will give you the best product for the month. And see, that's how Christian business ought to be done. Yes. Not only should Christian business be done that way, Christian work ought to be done that way. Yes. I hate right there under your Thank you. Hey, see. Christian work ought to be done the same way. Yeah, whatever they pay in you, don't work according to what they pay in you. Work according to the conscience that you have on the inside. Yo, don't go in there and say, well, he only paid me $8, so I'm going to give him $7 worth of work. No, he gave me $8, and I'm going to give him $15 worth of work. I'm going to work as hard and as good as I possibly can because I realize that it's not that man's check that's taking care of me. My check is really written on the bank of heaven. God is taking care of me. He controls my raises and my downfall. He will lift me up when the man tries to put me down. So I will continue to work as if I'm working for the Lord. I'm going to prove that I'm a faithful servant over a few things because I know that he'll make me rule over many if I just be faithful. So we got to transform our minds out acting like the world. Give me more money and I'll give you less work. Look at verse 3. It says there, for I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, accordingly, as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Don't be drunk on you. Mm -hmm. that's See, that's part of the problem. Yep. See, sometimes we think, huh, you got to go out to the club to get drunk. But Sister Harris, now there's some people who are walking around naturally drunk on themselves. They 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 crazy. They stumble around thinking they're so cute. They stumbling around thinking they really got it going on. Your ego has made you a folk. Walking around crazy, thinking you look all right when you look a hot mess. Because all you're doing is, is you're stuck on yourself. You're not thinking about anybody else. And when you try to live that way, you don't realize it because you're on the inside walking around silly. But the people around you realize how silly you are. Right. Folk walking around talking about, I got five jobs. You look like you're about to drop dead. <laughs> yeah, you got money in your pocket, but you crazy drunk from all the work. Folk talking about, well, I got to go to the gym three times a day. Yeah, your muscles, you can't even put them in your shirt no more, silly. <laughs> but caught on ourselves, oftentimes we walk around silly. People just looking at us, looking crazy going over by there. Because we're drunk on ourselves. Yeah. We need to be sober and realize that it's not about you, it is about the collective. I haven't gone anywhere if my brother and sister haven't gone with me. What good is it for me to live in the mansion while my brother lives in the shop? Mm -hmm. See, you haven't really arrived until the family arrives. All right. All right. See, that mentality that when I've done well, that's enough. That's not the right mentality, wrong answer. When they crossed the Red Sea, Moses didn't go by himself. Moses took his family with him. When Christ went to the cross, he didn't go to the cross just for him and Mary, his mother. He went to the cross for all of us. The Christian mentality is that I haven't arrived until everybody else arrives. Yeah. I haven't got there until I've helped somebody else along the way. Yeah. I haven't got there until I realize that God is calling me to do something for somebody else, do something greater and better and bigger than myself. To leave behind something that's better and greater. To leave behind something. One day, you know, one of my young sons, he said to me, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to get me a white Mercedes. He said, and I'm going to get a white interior. Shantae knows what I'm talking about. Talk about your brother. I'm going to get me a white interior. It's going to be white on white. White car. White Mercedes. And I'm not going to let kids eat in my car. That was his thing. I'm not going to let my kids eat in my car. I looked at him and I said, son, don't never let your children tear up anything. But you haven't arrived until you can let your children eat in your car. Oh, you didn't, you didn't get it. You didn't get it. See, right. if I really wanted to show off, Brother Robert, what I want 
is, is, is a big house that's got 10 bedrooms and, and 13 bathrooms. Oh, what I want is a big house with a circular, semi-circular driveway. And in that semi-circular driveway, when you know that I really, truly have arrived, is when there is a, a white Jaguar, brand new, sitting in the yard. And people drive up and they say, oh, that's a beautiful Jaguar sitting there in the yard. And I say, oh, that's my high school son's car. Mm -hmm. you, you, you ain't get it, did you? you see, see, you haven't really arrived uh, until you got enough that it overflows. See, you're not really walking in what God wants you to walk in until it's overflowing. He said, I will open up the, you want me to prove it? I will open up the windows of heaven and pull you out of blessing that you have not room enough to receive. So all of us who are walking around here with a 15-year-old Benz that's broke down thinking we've arrived, you ain't nowhere yet. <laughs> you don't have to like it, but it's true. See, what we think of as, as wealth, anytime you come to me and tell me you have arrived, I'll tell you how to do a little bit better. Okay. <laughs> but you're not doing good until you can give somebody. Let me tell you something. Last week, now, now if a non-Christian can do this, then what is God calling you to? Uh -oh. yeah. I jacked the other week. I had a conversation with a man. Contractor. He's doing some work on the Wexner Foundation building. And he said to me, he said, you won't believe this, but the Wexner Foundation, all they do is give away Mr. Wexner's money. He said, and in that building that only houses the Wexner Foundation, there are 16 employees in there, and all they do is give away Mr. Wexner's money. Oh, I wish somebody could catch this. But let me tell you, Amir Shaw, you, ha you haven't really arrived until you got to hire people to give your money away. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. See, oftentimes we think we're doing it, but we're not doing it. The devil has fooled us. Yeah. He's called us to be unconscious, thinking that we're making it and we're settling for good, but we're not great. Right. We're settling for a little bit when God has so much more for you. If you could first get your mind out of being selfish, because when you decide to give it away, then you realize that you've got some more left for you. Yes. God will bless you when you become a blessing to somebody else. Yes. God will bless you when your mind is transformed, because then it is not about trying to outdo somebody else. It's about how trying to help somebody else. Yes. So don't be drunk on yourself, because you ain't nobody no way. Look at verses 4 and 5. For as we have many members in the body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member one of another. We need to stay body thinking. We need to stay body thinking. And Sister Noah Green, I'm not talking about stay Stay bodybuilder thinking. I said stay body thinking. We need to always be thinking about each other. Yeah. Sister Jure, we ought to always be thinking about how do I fit into the bigger equation. In order to live better, it is to have a goal and, and some thought about somebody else. That's right. <laughs> it is important to realize that you are only a part of the puzzle. I remember some years ago they talked to the CEO who was over all of the internet uh, domain names. And, and they asked her, they talked to her about the domain names and so on and so forth. And uh, she, number one, she said that they thought it was odd that she did not have a television in her room and that she didn't take a cell phone to bed and any of those kind of things that she actually liked to unplug when she got home. Mm. But, you know, they asked her, they said, well, what are you trying to do because, you know, your job is so big and so on and so forth. She said, I don't necessarily think of my job as big. They said, what are you trying to do? She said, I'm trying to fix the world. And they said, well, that's a big job. How are you trying to fix the world? And she said to them, she said, I realize that and I see the world as a big puzzle. And as I see the world as a big puzzle, I see myself as being one part of that puzzle. 
She said, and so what I'm working on right now is trying to make sure that I am the right piece and that I have all of my edges and all of my pieces just right. She says, because if I don't have my piece of it right, then all of the things that need to connect will not connect properly. And so she was saying that, you know, in order to be the best and to help the world, it is first to decide to have all of your stuff together in order to help the people who are around you. So it is important that we always thinking about the body, always thinking about how we can help somebody else. Okay, so here's my commercial. Every young person in this church, I've asked you to do the same thing, and I'm going to ask you over and over and over and over again, and hopefully someday we'll have somebody who actually does it. I'm looking for a young person who decides that I'm going to go to college, and when I finish college, I'm going to give two years of service. Two years of service. Two years of service. I'm going to give to somebody else. I'm not going to fail this thing and, and, and can all I can and get all I can. But I'm going to decide that I'm going to, to, to devote my life to giving two years back. I'm going to look for something that's going to give. What that means, that doesn't mean that you're going to starve. That means that you might sign up uh, for, uh, <clears throat> you might sign up for AmeriCorps. That says that you might sign up to go on a foreign mission trip. They'll give you food, bread, and water. You're just not going to make a big profit. That might say that you're going to go work in an inner city school for a couple of years. Whatever the passion, whatever the purpose that God has given you in your life. But we need to start teaching our children and our young people to give back. Some years ago, I started saying this, and I've been saying it, and I'm going to keep saying it. I said it because of some embarrassment and some shock when I was told by our American Baptist churches that we don't have a, a lot of black missionaries. So we don't understand it, that, the, 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 the black churches don't send us missionaries. That doesn't that sound horrible? What it, what's even worse is it is the truth. I would have loved for it to just be some empty data, but it's the truth. It's because we're always thinking about money. We teach our kids, oh, when you graduate from college, go make money. When you graduate from college, I want to tell you, be like Jesus, go save the world. Take up your cross. When you graduate from college, go and use your resources to do something bigger and greater than yourself. Just a job is not enough. And if your parents were as honest as I am, just a job gets you nowhere but just a job. I've been working for about 30 years now, and I still got on the same kind of shirt. And he said,